If you're an American who's ever planned or gone on a trip to Mexico, I can all but guarantee that you were met with one of the following exclamations. You can't go to Mexico. It's not safe. Make sure you send me a proof of life every day. You're so much braver than me. I wouldn't go there, especially not now. Didn't you see the news last week? I'd cancel your trip if I were you. Make sure that you don't walk around looking like a target. The list goes on and on, and regardless of which of these sentiments you hear, they all share the same same kind of undertone. And this undertone, this sentiment is reinforced by the media and the narrative that we get fed here in the United States. A massive percentage, 77% to be exact, of adult Americans view uh, immigration from Mexico into the United States as a significant problem or a crisis. 85% of voters who identify as Republican in America view immigration as a source of increased crime in America. The reality is that research conducted by the University of Pennsylvania shows us actually that, and, and I quote, little evidence that Mexican immigration increases crime in the United States. If anything, there is some evidence that crime declines after immigrants arrive. With that in mind, what if I told you that Mexico City was actually safer than many cities in the United States? Actually, there's 110 cities in America with a higher murder rate per 100,000 people than Mexico City has. Recently, the murder rate across all of Mexico has actually declined by 7%, while in America it has increased by 20%. What if I told you that the best food in North America was actually in Mexico, and not only just in North America, it's actually some of the best food in the entire world. Backing that up, there's actually a number of restaurants on the world's 50 best list that are in Mexico City, have been in the top 10 of that list, and have been on that list for 10 years or more. What if I told you that as of this year, the best cocktail bar in North America is located in Mexico City? And what if I told you that I think it's 16 or 17 of the 50 best bars in North America are all in Mexico? What if I told you that the term Aztecs doesn't actually refer to the group of people who settled in Mexico City, and that it really isn't an accurate way of describing the cultural history there? What if I told you that Mexico City has over 150 museums, some of which are considered amongst the best in the world for the subject that they cover? And above all of that, I haven't even mentioned the incredibly warm, welcoming, and hardworking people of Mexico. Well, all of that is true. It's all backed by hard numbers statistics, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. My girlfriend and I just got back from a lovely 10 days at Mexico City. It was chock full of paradigm shifts and shattered expectations. I talked a lot about, in my last video around quitting Japanese, how impactful Japan and the Japanese culture has been on me and how it kind of became this dream that I had of living there someday. And Mexico City, Mexico more broadly, hasn't necessarily replaced Japan as my favorite place to go, though it's like kind of close. It has sparked a new dream for me, or at least reminded me of one, and we're going to talk about that later. Upon arriving in Mexico City and navigating the <laughs> insane traffic in our Uber, we were dropped off at our stunning Airbnb right across the street from Park Mexico. It, I mean seriously, Park Mexico is like they just dropped this incredibly lush jungle in the middle of the largest city in North America. It's so beautiful and vibrant and full of trees and flowers and free outdoor gyms and dance classes and just like anything and everything you can imagine. We were both feeling a little bit on edge when we first arrived because we were met with every single one of those aforementioned warnings that started this video out. So we decided to take it a little bit easy and just walk around this beautiful park and grab some dinner. By pure happenstance, we stumbled upon this place called Tortas al Fuego, and this ended up being our first of five visits to this incredible taqueria. Sitting in what could only be described generously in American terms as a hole in the wall, we placed our order in very rusty, very broken Spanish with a wonderful old man the kind of old man who immediately makes you feel like you belong in a place even though you don't, and waited for our food to come. And for the first time since landing, our, our nerves eased a little bit. After a short wait, we were greeted with our food, and I can't say this with enough emphasis, that first bite of my girlfriend's taco that I had was one of the best bites of food I have ever had in my entire life. Just doing some quick math, an order of five pastor tacos at Tortas al Fuego is 65 pesos, which is about $3.85. And if you compare that to Denver, where you can get an El Pastor taco at one of the better places in town for $5.50, and that's one taco versus five tacos, these tacos are 86% cheaper and at least 
300% more delicious. After this, we took another short walk to get some churros at Churria El Moro. It's a very well-known, well-regarded churro chain in Mexico City. And as we walked around the park, you couldn't help but be kind of almost overwhelmed by the amount of activity in life there. Whether it was boxing lessons or these massive salsa dance groups or outdoor fitness classes, or just couples kind of snuggling and kissing in the park, there was a veritable potpourri of action across this place. And surrounding this park are just tree-lined streets with quaint cafes and just wonderful little shops and full of people dining al fresco and just kind of taking in this incredible scenery. The park felt so alive. All of the people felt so present and engaged with their lives. And it just felt so peaceful. Our nerves from before eased even more. And this was really our first inkling that maybe Mexico wasn't like what we're told that it is. Over the course of the next 10 days, we were greeted with an endless spectacle of colored buildings and resplendent parks and incredible people. Our noses were assailed with the sense of food so delicious, I like still kind of can't comprehend it. And again, we were greeted with this kind of earnest warmth and welcoming and hardworking, just go get it attitude that I haven't seen anywhere. To put it mildly, Mexico City is incredible. Now, our experience being so disparate from the rhetoric that is spewed at us in the United States about Mexico, when we got back, I couldn't help but feel like, what gives? So I decided to do some research. At the beginning of this video, I spent a little bit of time listing off some kind of clickbaity facts about Mexico that I think are worth expounding upon, and we're going to get there. But first, I want to share a a story from a bike tour that we took. It's, it's really stuck with me. This tour was through a company called Food Hood, led by a man named Raul, and Raul is the realist, and Food Hood is dope. I highly, highly recommend it if you go to Mexico City. Anyway, the format of the tour was relatively simple. Meet at a taco joint, eat some tacos, ride your bike to the next taco joint, eat some more tacos, and along the way, like stop and talk about the history and talk about some of the monuments you're seeing and, and all of these kinds of things. And more than anything else, just making sure that you had a great time. And during the trip, as we're kind of biking through the city and stopping at some of these landmarks and different restaurants, Raul talked a lot about the last 10 to 15 years of Mexican history. And time and time again, especially when speaking about the government that ruled over Mexico from kind of like the early 2000s to 2010s, he used this phrase over and over and over again that has really stuck with me. And he said that they created a context of violence. He said that they intentionally sought to have Mexico portrayed as this kind of like desolate, violent, barbaric place. This deterred foreign investment and tourism outside of kind of the main designated areas. It made sure that the powers that be and the cartel were kind of left undisturbed to run things the way that they wanted to run things. And of course, this situation kind of benefited all of the people in power and the corruption just ran rampant through Mexico. And because there wasn't yet a lot of foreign investment, though that is changing very, very, very quickly, there weren't a lot of eyes on the reality of the situation in Mexico. And when asked further about kind of the state today, uh, someone else in our tour asked Raul, like, hey, is the police force corrupt still? And he responded really poignantly in a way that also has stuck with me. And he said, sure, there are still some people in the police force that are corrupt, but there's corruption everywhere. That's part of being human. That's the way humanity works. And it's no different in Mexico than it is anywhere else. Now I've attempted to research a little bit more about this context of violence and some of the background history that Raul mentioned. And unsurprisingly in the US, that's a little bit difficult to find because we're still sort of peddling this narrative that Mexico is some desolate hellscape that is coming for all of us. What I can tell you though, uh, is that all of the major statistics around violence in Mexico are dramatically declining. As I mentioned before, if you look at Mexico City specifically, there's actually 110 US cities with higher murder rates than Mexico City. And if you look more broadly at the crime and disease as a whole in Mexico City versus other cities in America, there's more than a handful of cities here that are actually more dangerous than Mexico City. And it's really kind of on par with Atlanta or Chicago as far as overall safety. As I was doing research for this, I was watching a video from Nomad Capitalist who I'm rapidly falling in love with his channel. He makes great stuff. But he said something that I thought was really uh, intelligent on the subject. And he said that when we talk about Chicago and the violence there, we don't blame Chicago, like gesturing broadly. 
we blame guns, we blame socioeconomic conditions, we talk about how there are certain parts of Chicago that you probably shouldn't go to. But when it comes to Mexico, we blame it wholesale just like without even thinking about it. We say that place is bad. And when in reality, it's actually like anywhere else. There's some places you can go and there's some places that you probably shouldn't go. And in the places you should go, you're actually safer than you are in most of America. Beyond safety being a common misconception in Mexico, there's the bit I mentioned about the food. <laughs> and oh God, the food. And it's not just tacos, it's, I, I just can't even, sorry, I'm having a moment here. But honestly, it's the best food maybe that I've had anywhere. Um, what I can say definitively is at the highest price point that I've ever had for a meal and at the lowest price point I've ever had for a meal, those two spots for best in that category is claimed by Mexico, hands down. Best high-end meal I've ever had in my life was at Pujol and best low-end meal I've ever had in my life was at Torches Al Fuego. And it's like not even close at all. Nothing holds a candle to it. And this caliber of food, like obviously given this kind of high and low price point that I just talked about, isn't just reserved for places like Pujol and Quintanil and these kind of world-renowned establishments. It's everywhere. It's a reverence for the culinary arts that I've really only ever seen in Japan and nowhere else. People care deeply about the origins of their food. We actually got like a pamphlet from Quintanil that described the like heirloom corn varietal that they use in the native, like the area that it's endemic to and all of the things that it does. It's, it was actually like pretty crazy. People there care about the story the food is telling you and how it represents Mexico and the culture as a whole. And what's more, the food is extremely affordable even when you're at these very high-end restaurants. And if you look at the world's 50 best list, cause there's not a Michelin guide for Mexico yet, although it does come out at some point this year, uh, Three of the top 50 restaurants in the world are located in Mexico City, one of which is in the top 10, Quintanil. And Quintanil's been on that list for 10 years consecutively. And Pujol's right up there with it. I don't know if it's 10 years or more, but uh, it's, it's been a long time. The only other cities with this degree of representation on that list are well-known powerhouses like Lima, where the best restaurant in the world currently is, New York City, Tokyo, and... Paris. Most recently, the bar Handshake Speakeasy won the best cocktail bar in North America. Also on that list, and I'm just going to read off from this now because I'm not going to remember all of these, was Rayo, Tlacan, El Gallo Altanero, Licoria Limentor, Zapote Bar, Aruba Day Drink, Cafe de Nadie, Baltra Bar, Catio del Valle, Selva, Arca, Hanky Panky, and Brujas. That's like, like I said, 15 or 16 or 17 of the best bars in North America, all in Mexico. And it's, it's not just tequila or mezcal, although those are very important beverages to the country. There's again, just like I talked about with food, there's this kind of reverence for the art of creating the perfect cocktail that I haven't seen anywhere outside of Japan. When people talk about Mexico and its history, you'll inevitably hear the term Aztecs to describe the people who settled in the modern day area of Mexico City, Mexico as a whole. And that's actually not true. You can kind of make an argument that that's who they were, but it's not the right term. There were no Aztecs as such in the area known as Mexico City today. Aztecs is a term used to refer to their origins. They came from this place called Azatlan, which eventually collapsed as part of some other empire. And they, as a result of that, decided to migrate south. None of the historical records available to us from the Spanish conquest or before actually ever used the term Aztec. They only used the term Mexica. And that's because Mexica is how these people referred to themselves. They didn't use the term Aztec. Aztec. And Mexico, if you use the etymology of that language, actually quite literally means the place in which the Me Mexica lived. And it was Mexico, not Mexico or Mexico. When the Azteca left Azatlan during the collapse of that aforementioned empire, they journeyed south until they found or were kind of connected with their patron god. And I'm going to butcher this pronunciation, I apologize, but it's Huitzilopochtli, also known as Mexi. He told them that they should change their name to the Mexica and continue journeying south until they arrived in their rightful home. And they would know the sign that denoted they had arrived in their 
right place when they found it. And that sign now is seen all over the Mexican flag of the eagle carrying the snake sitting on a cactus. And if you want to explore more of this really colorful kind of crazy history, the museums in Mexico are absolutely world-class, especially the Museum of Anthropology, where they have an entire exhibit dedicated to the Mexica. Whether it's this Museum of Anthropology, the Frida Kahlo Museum, the Palacio de, de Be Bellas Artes, uh, the Museum of Modern Art, the only European castle in North America, or any of the kind of like small hipster galleries you'll find in Condesa or in Roma, there is something for everyone. And Mexican art is dark, it's vibrant, it's colorful, it attacks issues head on and minces no words. It's unlike art I've really seen anywhere else. Uh, and it's it's really powerful, it's really beautiful. If you get the chance to see it, I, I highly recommend it. Our aforementioned tour guide, Raul, said something else that has stuck with me and it, it was just beautiful. He said that for 500 years, people have been coming to Mexico and trying to steal the Mexican way of life and culture from them. And they've arrived at a point where they've collectively said no more. We are going to embrace who we are and what we do and the way we live our lives and that's the way it's going to be. My time in Mexico City has dramatically shifted the way I feel about Mexico as a whole but also really Central and South America more broadly anywhere that we would consider Hispanic here in the States. It's made me question the assumptions fed to us by the media even more than I already did which for me is saying something because I tend to be a very skeptical person of those things in general. It's exposed me to a way of life and a degree of peace that I've never felt in the United States or really anywhere else, including most of Europe and the parts of Asia that I've seen. And when I mentioned earlier that this trip planted the seeds of a new dream or kind of reminded me of an existing one, it's just that we should, if we're in a position of being able to, travel as broadly and deeply as we can with open arms. Travel is an opportunity to kind of shed our preconceived notions and more accurately paint the picture, the truth of the way the world really is. It's inspired me to slow down and remember what's important. And like I talked about in my values video before, like reorient my life and my goals in a way that feels really good for me. I'm extraordinarily grateful to Mexico and its people and I honestly cannot wait to go back. I'm actually hoping to go back later this year. I hope this video inspires somebody somewhere to either go to this incredible country or city or even to just take a little bit of time to reconsider some like stereotypes, preconceived notions, or stigmas they might hold against it. As always, if you learned something, if this matches your experience of Mexico, or if you beg to differ, frankly, it doesn't really matter, but there's nothing more supportive to me than a like, a comment, or above all, hitting that subscribe button so that I continue, so that I can continue to make content for all of y'all and hopefully continue to teach you some things and share my experience. So with that, till next time folks.